أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So last night we uh, ended with with a with a brief summary of the different levels of intellect of each person, each era, each generation, all of mankind, and so on and so forth. So, for example, we said for the time of Nabi Ibrahim, they had a different intellect, for example, to our time, and that's why when Ibrahim salam, presented the evidences. After all of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka hujjatuna atainaha Ibrahim ala qawmihi. These are the evidences that we gave Ibrahim for his people. We don't necessarily take everything that Ibrahim alayhi salam, what he said, and apply it today. No, we take the principles and the essences and the way we discuss and debate and we apply it today and see what's applicable today. Then we started speaking about the individual level. And we said that individually each person has a different capacity, intellectual capacity. Now when I say intellectual capacity, I'd like to break it down into two segments. One which is something that we can work on. Okay, So, so when I say the intellectual capacity, I mean more the cognition the ability and the process to take information, to take experiences, to take your senses, process that and understand what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, what is correct, what is incorrect, okay? Now, that's very dependent upon information and knowledge. Information and knowledge. Now, all of us here have different accesses and storages and amounts of knowledge and information, correct? What's in my head, again, this is all metaphorical, what's in my head is different to what's in your head and what's in your head and so on and so forth. Now, unfortunately, when we discuss with people, we go with the assumption that what I understand is what you understand. And if I explain something, then I expect you to understand it. And if you don't understand it, you're either arrogant, stubborn, stupid, whatever it is. We don't consider that, for example, this person doesn't have the same knowledge that I have. That person doesn't have the same experiences that I have. Experiences are extremely important. Why? Our parents lived in a different generation than us. Their experiences are totally different than our experiences. Now, when we come to, together and discuss, for example, Muharram, something simple like Muharram, I had a brother come and speak to me yesterday. He says, I'm having a lot of trouble discussing these things with my parents. All they want to do is the emotional rituals. Well, I think we should benefit a bit more with some intellectual discussions. There's a clash here. Why? Not because he loves Imam al Hussein and they don't love Imam al Hussein or vice versa. They both love Imam al Hussein, but their experiences and upbringing and environment is completely different. So there's a clash. So the first thing we need to do is come to a common grounds. Understand what links are missing, what information is missing, what background is missing. Now, information is extremely important. And there's, there's an example in the Quran where it shows that. Just one piece of information missing can, can, can cause a lot of confusion and misunderstandings. Simple example is the story of Musa salam and Khidr salam. Very easy example to use. Of course, the, the, the story is very deep and esoteric, but I just want to take one aspect and element and lesson from it. In that Musa had a lot of knowledge, correct? But about a certain three events, Khidr had a little bit more knowledge. Now, when they took part in what happened, I'm not going to go into it because I don't have time, but three incidents took place. Musa saw it one way, Khidr saw it 
another way. And Musa could not understand why Khidr did such and such action. Until the three events happened and then afterwards Khidr explained that what you didn't realize was there is a different piece of information that you did not have access to which I did. As soon as that information was revealed, everything was contextualized and they were now on the same level of understanding, correct? Before the incidents, what did Khidr say to Musa? He says, you will not have patience. How can you have patience when you don't have a complete understanding of what's going to happen? So here, when I say intellectual capacity on one side, I'm speaking about the information and experiences that we have. On the other hand, there's another type of dimension that we need to talk about and that's the intellectual capacity that is given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some people no matter how much information that you give them if I give two people the same amount of information and have had similar experiences and upbringings one person might understand it the other person might not and this is why without our imma there is there is certain knowledges that they call secret that's for the elite of the elite. One simple example is the difference between Salman and Abu Dhar. May Allah be pleased with them both. Both of them are companions of Imam Ali. The closest of companions to Imam Ali. Now there's narrations that say that Salman was slightly superior to Abu Dhar. Why? Because the knowledge that Salman could handle, his intellectual capacity was slightly higher than Abu Dhar's. To the point, to the point that they say that if Abu Dhar knew what Salman knew and believed, then essentially he would be doing they would be doing takfir of one another. Abu Dhar would do takfir of Salman. Why? Because Abu Dhar would look at the same thing and he would think that this is shirk, for example. While some Salman sees this as the highest levels of Tawheed. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now this might be a bit strange and difficult to fathom, but I'll give you a real life experience that I had. People who know me and have discussed this topic with me will understand where I'm coming from. I'm going to speak about it on a very brief level, again because I don't have time. But Tawheed itself is a complex topic. It's not as simple as saying God is one. It's not as simple as that. Tawheed is a complex topic. Now there's the Tawheed of just saying Allah is one, Allah is independent and so on and so forth. Then there's different levels of Tawheed. For example, Wahdat al-Wujud. I'm not going to explain what Wahdat al-Wujud is because I know I don't understand what Wahdat al-Wujud is. But there was a time where I was reading about this concept and it didn't make sense to me. Now I thought I had the intellectual capacity to understand that. And when I was reading it, I thought this is shirk, this is kufr, this is misguidance, right? Because it was above my intellectual capacity. So what I started doing was saying anyone who believes in this is misguided and misguided. Misguided and misguiding. And when I would ask people, scholars who accepted this, people that accepted this, learned people, they will say you don't understand this, this is beyond, beyond you. So instead of me accepting that, because it's difficult to accept, what did I say? This is just you saying that because you don't know how to reply to me. Until one scholar, may Allah preserve him, asked me to explain what you think it is. And I explained. And he went through step by step and pinpointed one point in my argument. And he said, here you have made a mistake. You have confused al-ism with al-ism al-ism. Again, this is a complex topic but I had built my understanding of Wahdat al-Wujud upon something that I had no idea about. It was built upon a fallacy. And this happens a lot with us brothers and sisters. Sometimes we accuse other schools of thoughts or other, other religions of things that they believe and then you ask them and they say, actually we don't believe in this. Why? Because do we learn from them or do we learn from ourselves? We learn from ourselves. And when we read the arguments from ourselves, we make their arguments as weak as possible. Is that not correct? Correct. Correct. Ahsant. 
صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد So here there's two lessons in this real life experience. As soon as I understood my my problem, I took a step back and I said, look, I can't really understand this right now. Maybe, maybe I have the potential, but it would take a lot of hours of studying and research. But for now, I don't have the intellectual capacity to understand this. So I say, I don't know. And brothers and sisters, there's nothing wrong with saying I don't know. In fact, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam encourages this. When you don't know, don't act like you know. Say that you don't know and humble yourself. That's one lesson. On the other hand, when you ask people, what do you mean by this? I don't understand this. Take the time to understand how they understand it. Tell me, what do you think this means? Don't just say, oh, you're stupid, or oh, you're kafir, or oh, you're arrogant. This is not the way that we should be working each other. We should be helping each other. And perhaps that person doesn't understand simply because there's a missing piece of Ahsant Habibi. More coins for you tonight, inshallah. <laughs> Missing piece of information. Salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa And here, there's an important point to consider. There's a narration from the Ahlul Bayt. Specifically, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. I've read it, and some other imams. It says, It says, Haddithu nas bima ya'rifoon. Speak to people with what they are able to comprehend. Don't speak to people with things that you know that they will reject immediately. Remember we said we speak to people based upon their level of intellect. If I start speaking to a young person about, let's say, Wahdat al-Wujud, straight away they'll say, this Allah, I don't want this Allah. I don't understand this Allah. And this is why they say sometimes the Irfani concepts, they have to be careful who they speak to about. And you need a teacher. Now, I want to apply this concept to the Husseini rituals. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and I know Shaykh Nami, may Allah preserve him, touched upon this last night as well. But for ta'keed, with this Husseini rituals, there is a time and a place for it, as he mentioned. It is not necessarily a tool that we use for da'wah. For example, we have that procession, we have arba'in. One of the beautiful things we see is when we take out water bottles and we hand it out with a message on there. When we do, for example, donations and, and blood donations and whatnot. Why? Because this relates to the people around us, the ones that we're doing da'wah. Do they understand this? Do they comprehend this? Yes, they comprehend it. They understand. Why? Because for a majority of people, their religion is human rights, generosity, love, mercy, compassion. If you do the, these things that they understand and comprehend in the name of Imam al Hussein, this is going to be a great way of doing da'wah. But if I go and I start for example, doing traditional Husseini rituals like beating your chest in the middle of the city. Firstly, they're going to look at you like, what the hell are these guys doing? Why? Do, because do they understand these things? No. And by the way, I'm not against beating your chest. Here we do it. Here I take part in it. What I'm saying is when you go outside and present the image of Imam al Hussein, is this the best way to do it? Not only are you doing something that they do not comprehend, but you do something that they hate. In what sense? The most busiest time of the year, I mean, sorry, the busiest time of the day, we're in the middle of the busiest area in Melbourne, in Melbourne Central. And we, alhamdulillah, we call the police and we say, block these roads so that we can spread the message of Imam Hussein. So the police come and they block the roads. I've seen with my own eyes people walking past with frustration. Why? They're like, what are these guys doing here blocking our, our path going when it's the busiest time of the day we're trying to get to work? We get annoyed when when Jehovah's Witness come in the comfort of our home, yet we want to go and, and make people uncomfortable because we want to spread the message, is there a better way of doing it? Talk to the people in a way that they are able to understand and comprehend, not in a way that they'll re reject. He finishes off by saying, do you like to see that Allah and His Messenger be rejected? 
What does that mean? Meaning if you say something, for example, I'm spreading the, the message of Imam and Hussein alayhi salam, and these people, instead of taking the time to listen to it, they say, I'm not interested in this person. I'm not interested in your religion. It hurts, doesn't it? But you have to ask the question, is that their fault or is that my fault in the way that I'm presenting it? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now this leads me to the question that I ended with last night and that the uh, MC Sister Zahra had mentioned. Are people held accountable by in proportion to their intellect or are we all accountable in the same way? If somebody for example does not accept the truth not because they reject the truth for it being the truth. For example, if a person from this side, the intellect with the evidences, understands something to be true, and then with this side, where he has an option, rejects that, of course he's going to be held accountable. But that's not my question. My question is, is if a person does not comprehend or understand or accept the evidences on this side, Therefore, he does not follow it because he believes it's not true. Meaning, it's not necessarily reflecting the reality, but it's reflecting his perceptions of the reality. Is he held accountable by those standards or by the standards of the reality? Meaning, because he doesn't accept the truth, he's going straight to the hellfire. Now, I'll use the most obvious and greatest examples of rejecting truth, which is Tawheed. If you have the incorrect understanding of Tawheed, are you going straight to hell? For example, some people believe that God has a body. Correct? Inshallah, we don't believe in that. But some schools of thought, some religions believe that Allah or God or the Creator has a body or manifested in a body. And sometimes He comes down, He rides a donkey every Friday to visit the creation. There are some religions and, and, and sects that believe in this. If that person believes this because he believes this is the truth or his intellectual capacity limits him to this, will he be going straight to hell or will he not? I'll give you one narration from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam from Al-Kafi volume 1. Salawat. <laughs> Imam al-Sadiq, there was a discussion between between Imam al-Sadiq and a companion. And so Imam al-Sadiq gives, gives this person uh, a story to give him the realities of how things work. He says, there was a man from Bani Israel. He lived in a remote island, away from everyone else. But this island was beautiful. This island had lush green grass, beautiful trees, panoramic view of the water. Imagine Hawaii, for example. Beautiful, beautiful area he lived in. But he lived there by himself. And all he did was worship Allah. That's all he did. Worship Allah. An angel saw this man worshipping sincerely all the time. And he asks Allah, what is the reward of this person? I want to see his reward. This person who is so sincere worshipping you. Allah showed the angel the reward that he will be getting. But it was only a, a little bit. It was not much. Not something that reflected the amount of worship. The angel thought, this is not a lot of reward. And maybe, you know, we talk about in heaven we get palaces. and uh, Maybe he had a small hut. I don't know what it was. He didn't describe it, but something small. So the angel said, but this is very small. Allah says, I reward people in proportion to their level of intellect. The angel says, what do you mean? Allah said, go down, spend a day with this person and you'll understand. So the angel manifested itself in a shape of a, a, a human and came down and then met this person. The person said, who are you? The angel in this form of a man said, I'm just a person who've heard, who's heard that you worship Allah sincerely and I just want to spend some time with you. The man said, ahlan wa sahlan, come worship with me. So from that point on until the, the night time, they worshipped Allah only. And then they fell asleep and woke up in the morning. Maybe they only slept 10 minutes as worshippers would. 
They woke up and the angel was looking around at this beautiful scenery and he said, Subhanallah, with this sort of scenery that Allah has created and blessed you with, you really can't help but do anything but worship. Like you're, you feel so blessed that you just want to worship Allah. The man looks at him and says, yeah, look, it's good, but there's some deficiencies in it that Allah made. So the angel's like, what do you mean? The man said, look, this green grass, it's nice, but it has no purpose. If only God had one of those animals that he rides on to give me. The angel said, what do you mean? He says, you know, if he had you know, a donkey that he rides on, he could let me take care of that donkey. And then with that donkey, he'll eat all that grass and at least there'll be some purpose for this grass. The angel looked at him and he said, Salaamu Alaikum and went back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah said, you see, I give reward based on, on the proportion to that person's intellect. Now, the scholars look at this narration and have concluded a few things. One, this person lived in a very remote area. Meaning, did he have access to all the information and libraries and the internet and so on and so forth to understand and research Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what the realities of Allah is? Not necessarily. So the environment that he lived in was not supporting his intellect growing. Further than that, he attributed deficiencies to Allah. Meaning Allah made a mistake when he created this island. And the third thing he did, tajseem. He made Allah have a physical form that rides upon a donkey. Now, important point here. Was this person punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? Not only was he not punished, not only was he not held accountable for his limited capacity in the intellect, but he was rewarded. He was rewarded. So now we have to think about this. A person who does what we would call shirk is getting rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, it's very small and I'll explain why. Why did he only get a small reward? Let me just have a sip of water. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It's very good to stay hydrated. Um, so, first about the accountability. There's a narration from Abi Ja'far alayhi salam. He says, "Inma yudaqullah al-ibad fi al-hisab yom al-qiyamah ala qadri ma atahum min al-aqul fi dunya." Allah only holds people accountable by the level of the intellect they had in the dunya. So does this support what I'm saying? Yes, I would hope so. Of course, people are going to be saying, is this really an evidence? I understand it a different way. No problem. I encourage disagreement. There's a question box. I encourage you to raise some concerns about this. That's the first thing. The second thing is, some people might say, that's not fair. Allah made me really smart and have given me a really great capacity and intell I'm, I'm just smarter than everyone else but that means I'm accountable more than anyone else. Likewise, the one who has less intellect might say, hang on a second, I'm worshipping Allah in the best possible way I can. How come I'm only getting a little bit of reward? If I'm worshipping Allah the same way that that person's worshipping Allah, but God made my capacity a lot smaller than everyone else, why am I only getting small reward? I want His reward as well. We have to answer these questions. Now, Allah, five minutes, subhanAllah, not even halfway. Got to really work on my time management here, but that's okay. We'll get there inshallah. I'll finish off with, with answering this question. Allah rewards people with what is suitable for them. What is suitable for them. If my intellect has a limited capacity, I won't necessarily appreciate the thing that a person who has a greater capacity has. For example, let's, let's use a, a, a valid example that we can all relate to. If I had 
for example, a child on my right and someone that was from there, we brought him here. And I had one of the sisters come here. And I took out a lollipop and I took out a check for $5,000. If I gave that check to the child, will he be looking at me holding that check and saying, uh, uh, wanting the lollipop? He'll probably, he'll probably rip the check from tantrum and won't stop crying until he gets the lollipop. Likewise, if I gave the check to the child and I gave the lollipop to one of the sisters, you would hope the sisters will be like, um, isn't it better if we swap that? Why? Because their level of intellect, I mean, not women in general, I'm saying everyone, we're all on the same intellectual level, right? Women, men, the ones that who have developed intellects will appreciate the check a lot more because they understand the value of that check while the one with lower intellect will they understand the value of it or will they think the most important thing in the whole world at this point in time is that lollipop likewise when it comes to gender what do they say the most valuable valuable reward is in gender either do you want a lollipop They say the most valuable reward that you can attain in heaven, and Allah only mentions it once or twice, is Ridwanullah. The pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now if I said this to a, a mystic or an Arif, they will probably start shedding tears, right? Because they would be able to appreciate that pleasure and having a conversation with Allah. They can't imagine anything better than a conversation with Allah or studying under Amir al Mu'mineen in heaven. However, for many of us, including myself, if I were to say, I ha I'm giving you an option, either a conversation with Allah or lying down on a velvet couch in your Louis Vuitton silk robe with maidens brushing your hair and feeding you grapes, playing Fortnite, which one would you prefer? I would really, of course, in front of all of you people, I would say, no, oh, conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But deep down, I'd be thinking, look, man, new update on Fortnite. That silk robe I've been looking on the internet for such a long time, and I'm not allowed to wear silk in the dunya. At least let me wear silk in the akhirah. Why? Because my capacity, my intellectual capacity, cannot appreciate the high level of spirituality of having a conversation with Allah. So can we see how... The more accountability we have, the more burden we have, naturally the reward will be higher. The less accountability we have, the less capacity we have, that reward, if we are sincere and our heart submits to our intellect and our brain and our logic, we will get a reward that's suitable for us. There was so much more I wanted to talk to, but inshallah we'll continue this tomorrow. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.